Yes, Eric. Meist, Meister Erich. Ja. Yeah. <laughs> Very good to see you. Yeah, it's good to see you too. It's uh, as I said, it's been it's been a while. Um, yeah. 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 So how how is your reality? How is my reality? It's uh, you know, blessings and curses. Um, uh, yeah. Wow. I don't even know where to start. It's um. Uh, deepening. I've definitely made a shift in my own consciousness that's been interesting. There's definitely some fruits of meditation and self um, sort of observation have have kicked in at a new level. And I find that my uh, my kind of core commitment to some idea about how reality works is loosening, which is kind of um, refreshing, a little bit unnerving. Like, what do I think? What's real? Um, and, uh, you know, then sometimes it's, it's easy to get buffeted by, you know, apocalyptic feelings as well. Um, so, yeah. but in general, it's been good. Uh, okay. Can you go into more detail about that shift and what you think or experience reality is? Um, well, in like, it, it's probably easiest to talk about it in Buddhist terms, although I don't think it's exclusively a Buddhist thing. But um, there's this sort of idea, and this might sound kind of abstract and intellectual, but it'll come around. That's, that's, that's fine. That, uh, you know, there's a core idea of emptiness, that things have no inherent substance, and that everything that arises, arises through causes and conditions sort of as part of a emergent network of phenomena. So that way you can even be a little bit sciencey about it. You can say, yeah, every, you know, everything does arise, but it arises because of causes and conditions and it has no abiding essence. Mm -hmm. And one way you can imagine that then is like how, well, how does that make reality seem like just everyday phenomenological reality? What's different about that view? It's not that I don't see the computer or the cushion or the lights or anything, but it's now very clear to me the way that normally, normally, generally in, the, in my past, I would impute a substance behind the phenomena. Like, yeah, I'm seeing the light because there's a light there and the light has, uh, you know, electricity going through it and it comes from the power grid and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I see the couch, it's red because it's red and it, it's, it has the angle that it does to my eyes because it's this physical object and if I move around, I'm gonna see it from different points. So there's this unconscious reification of everything in the world that it's like actually this object. Mm -hmm. And what I'm describing is a shift where sometimes there's no longer a sense that there's any substance on the other side of the phenomena. There's just the arising of the phenomena. And, you know, again, you know, in terms of physical reality, arguably that that might be the case, because what I'm really perceiving is my brain's modeling of reality based on its own history. So I'm not really seeing a chair, I'm seeing a my brain's modeling chairness and then like, oh yeah, I got a model going, doesn't really have anything behind it necessarily or in the way that we impute it. It doesn't mean I don't think I get up and I touch the chair that there isn't gonna be a chair there, mm -hmm. but there, it, 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 it's, that's what I mean. It's like a more of a, um, it's hard to say, describe, but it's more of an experience of the world as just a ceaseless arising of effects and that through that there's I, my relationship with it is a little different there's more mm -hmm. space around it it's not that it doesn't have reality or doesn't make a claim it's not like if i see 
somebody on the street who's having a bad time, like, oh, it's just a, a phenomena that's arising. There's not a person there that I'm in some ways ethically bound up with, even if I don't know what to do about it. Doesn't take that kind of sting away, but it definitely has created a shift, uh, a kind of brightness to things. Because weirdly, you would think that if if there's a sense of less substance to the objects around you that that would seem more gaseous or more fog like but it's actually the opposite things become crisper mm -hmm. brighter more vibrant mm -hmm. uh and it's you know it's a it's a noticeable effect and is this something that i've that is a inevitable outcome of certain kinds of practices I don't know. Is it something that gets seated in your mind because so your mind, so like your brain learns to model reality in a new way because you've been reading these texts and doing these practices. And at some point it goes, oh, we can model things as if there is not a, a substance on the other side of the phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And then that's going to have this kind of effect. And so, you know, and it's, there's no real way outside of that, that loop. So it's important to keep asking those questions, but it's mm -hmm. also important for me to really see what the new view opens up in terms of um, my own attitude and how I relate to objects in the world and uh, kind of explore a different framework from the inside. You see, like, I, for me, you have uh, said very, many interesting things now, but like maybe the most interesting thing is this um uh, idea that or this understanding that when you're talking about substance versus say no substance uh whatever the dichotomy like there is right like if we assume that we or whatever we are construct our reality it doesn't i mean in a way it doesn't even matter if there is substance or not, like it, like what is the carrier? We could say, like, is there a carrier out there um, for this? Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. Maybe the chair is, like, like Castaneda would say, like, is sort of like an agreement of two beings that there is, like, a, like their light sources are crossing over or something like that. Like, like you know, there's so many ways that we could kind of like describe this, like how the substance may actually original where it may originate um, and that's why i kind of like what you just said that that you have sort of like regained a new uh, experience of reality via sort of like a like some sort of tinting or sharpening effect or i find that that's that's amazing that's good it's very yeah. good <laughs> yeah it ha it's a it's a definite phenomenological light it has to do with not just light but mostly the visual field not just the visual field and it's uh th there's and i remember the first time it happened to me and it was it sounds kind of cheesy because it was at a it was um well maybe that's not tr true the first time but one time i remember very clearly uh, we were in china my wife and i and we were with a tour group a super cool like mostly zen practitioners but luckily they weren't too serious. There were a lot of funny people and we were having a good old time. And we, we visited a, a monastery and I was just looking at the, you know, the, the bamboo forests around the monastery and the wind was blowing. And bamboo is really interesting because more than I think other kinds of trees, they, they sort of bend independently in the wind because they're, they're more turbulent because they're, 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 have, they're less st stable. So they respond to different currents in the, in the turbulence more than other trees do or in a different way. And I just I remember this experience of just having this thing where it was, it's just hard to describe. Again, there was just this visual phenomena but there was no tree there. There wasn't somebody in a place looking at a thing. It was just this sort of appearance. So it's more like a mirage or like something you see in a mirror, which is an image that they use a lot in, you know, in Buddhism at the end of the Diamond Sutra, the Buddha, you know, it's which is kind of a weird, sort of a gnarly, kind of complicated, hard to understand, strange, sort of also like not quite the kind of questions we would ask. So it's it's a little alien. 
And then at the end, there's this, this killer set of similes about the, you know, the world is a bubble, is a dream, is a conjure show, you know, this kind of image of, of illusion. And I've never really been attracted to the idea of like, oh, the world's an illusion. I mean, it's interesting. I played with it, Philip K. Dick. It's, you know, I've written about a lot of it, but the idea of like walking around going, oh, it's an illusion. But the idea that it's sort of like an image in a mirror is a little different. It it has that quality of like, well, if it's like an image in the mirror, the, again, there's no substance there. If you're looking at a mirror, you're looking at an image, there's an image, there's a thing, but the thing isn't like in the mirror. Yeah. And that that's kind of more the quality that I'm talking about. So it doesn't take you out of the phenomena entirely, like it's just a total fabrication. But there is a sort of recognition of its fabricated quality. Um, and there's a lightness or a lack of something behindness of it. Uh, and that's really trippy. And it's really trippy when you kind of feeds back to, to me. Like, maybe there's nothing behind this. <laughs> you know, we walk around like there's an eye somewhere and the eye is having thoughts and the eye is feeling feelings and the eye is making plans. And it's back there somewhere with his hands on the controls. And we know that's kind of maybe not true, but we sort of feel a lot of the time, at least I do, that it's sort of true. It's just sort of the base, the, the kind of generic feeling. But sometimes that's not there. And there's just the arising of the self in the moment or whatever, what we mistake for the self. You know, when, when, when I first started thinking about these things, right, like, and like the idea of the fabrication of sorts, like it came. One of the most stunning things to me then was like, so like, like now we're even like fabricating the trying to understand that we fabricate and we sort of like come up with this organ that we call brain where like in our, in most cultures, we're like projecting everything into that structure as being the originator of of the reality of the fabrication right and it's it's, it's so meta in itself already like it's really i, f I find that amazing like <laughs> you know like yeah. why 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 would you why would you need to even kind of like have right to, you know what but, i mean you know what i'm talking about right? then. Yeah. yeah 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 and that's part of what what I mean about what's weird about happening and, and it's sometimes unsettling is it makes me realize how much, well, I both consciously and unconsciously I have invest, I invested in a certain kind of physicalist account of reality. That there are objects and there's a history of matter and da 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 da. da. And, you know, as an intellectual position, I've been interested in approaching spirituality and mysticism from a more materialist point of view for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. But I'm not talking so much about like an ideology or for or like a concept about the world or philosophy of materialism or anything like that. I'm talking more about the sort of unspoken assumption that this is how the world works. And so when you when you bring this up about the brain part of me wants desperately to hold on to the brain because then I have a story about the fabrication. So I can say, well, now we know uh, the brain is a predictive processing uh, organ. It's running algorithms that construct reality and it's based on its previous experience. So it doesn't have to kind of constantly do more work. It can kind of just throw up the chair that it already knows and that's what's happening so i'm really inside of a virtual reality model that my brain is generating and in a way that sounds like super weird and it's like seems like really counterintuitive and you're undermining the sense of ordinary reality but in another way it's very satisfying it's it still gives you something to hold on to but i think that the bigger that cast you mentioned castaneda that that there's another way of doing it that's more for kind of ferocious, which is you just all you really recognize is that there's fabrication going on, and yet 
there are these agreements that we're still functioning with and that's it you don't you don't get to go wow it's because the brain is running this algorithm Mm -hmm. well that sounds nice that's actually nice and concrete i'd actually Mm -hmm. almost rather go you know I mean, here's another thing about that. So there's the, 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 the way we hold on to the brain is another kind of myth. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's the thing about what do we do with the re- with, okay, it's, it's just an appearance arising. And there's a sort of language in a lot of spirituality. Oh, there's just a, it's just happening. It's not really there. It's just a, it's a dream. It's passing. And yeah, but it's this dream, like it's this red couch and this chair and this, guy on the on the, this device and so the ordinary reality almost comes back as this kind of incredibly magical appearance that has logic it has stories it's not that it goes away it's not that you're just sitting there going oh all this is a complete you know demonic delusion or anything like Descartes it's it's that uh it becomes almost even more not real but more what it is what it specifically is. And it's sort of magical that all these things appear over and over again. Once I give up on this idea that I can explain why. I don't know. Yeah, isn't that amazing? Like what you just described is reality as being magical because things reappear. Like, you know, like what about dreams? Like dreams in our reality. Like Eric goes to bed and he dreams of like a green meadow and some flowers or whatever and wakes up and the flowers are gone, right? Are they? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I was thinking about that a lot in terms of illusions. Magic, because one of those metaphors that, that you find in Buddhist texts is that is a magical illusion, like a magician. And then you think about, well, what's a magician doing? What is the difference between, it's, I mean, it's, it's a little tricky. Let me go through it. So like I'm, I, uh, I, uh, as a magician, I create the illusion that I'm, you know, pulling uh, a card out of thin air. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's my perception as the audience member, a card was pulled out of thin air. When we say that's an illusion, it really means that, something else happened than what I experienced. But my experience of the card emerging out of thin air is part of reality. Mm-hmm. It's not just my reality. It's like reality. It's like this is the way it appeared. So it's really more about my explanation of what might have happened. If I, oh, no, that guy pulled it. He can pull cards out of thin air. That's more we get into where that's just not true. But it's, when I see the, the card out of thin air, that's true in a way, um, mm-hmm. on, on, at least on the level of appearance. And, and everything's like that. Yeah, yeah you know, the, <laughs> the, the, the two words that I use in that context uh, are uh, expectation and surprise. Mm. Yeah, so, so what is magic really it is like things happening that you're not expecting that are surprising and there may or they may not be an explanation but as you say all of that is part of reality yeah yeah Yeah, i mean if i if i understand you correctly i mean like if that's what you're just Mm -hmm. (laughs) very much I mean, that's the way I, I like the the new brain, the, the latest brain myth. You know, like we have these myths of like the engine that's constructing things. And then we have a brain and it's got nerves. And now we have a brain that's running algorithms and creating constructs. But one of the things that's cool about it is precisely in that myth between expectation and surprise. What it's doing is just running expectations based on its priors Mm -hmm. and then it hits a surprise and it's got to like compensate for it and you know come up with something else another story fill in the gap or ignore it you know there's there's a and and so i think one thing i like about that myth is that it encourages us to constantly be 
open to surprise and that there is more surprise going on than we usually acknowledge because it's just easier. There's less cognitive load to see the same thing, to in a way get bored. Yeah. Oh, it's the street, you know, and I've lived in the same apartment for 30 years. So like I've had ample opportunity to get completely, completely, you know, uh, familiar with the repetition of physical spaces, objects, and the challenge of staying fresh in your view when the vi the visual situation or, or the phenomenological situation is the same. That's a really nice, that's a really valuable thing to, to, to keep the surprise in the picture or op keep open to the surprise in the, in the midst of all the repetition that constitutes our kind of banal ordinary lives. So when, when uh, thinking about simulations or using the term simulation or even just illusion, the, the you know, the term or the idea of the, of the glitch, um, in, in, in how far is that part of your reality, the glitch? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, intellectually, I've been on to that glitch thing for a very long time, you know, since I was a, really since I was a teenager. So certainly since I started to work on Philip K. Dick uh, as a, you know, thinker and r religious figure, as well as a novelist, you know, tuning into that idea about that one little, the crack in reality that points to something else, at least to the illusion of the real of what it seems to be reality, if not actually a kind of transcendent realm. And that basic dynamic is really key to my worldview. Uh, I think when I was younger, it was more intellectual and conceptual and maybe imaginative uh but very important like i had a lot of really significant dreams that were about like tuning into glitches like here's a here's like one dream it's short don't worry <laughs> uh, you know I'm, I'm walking through this kind of depressing industrial landscape kind of like the outskirts of of uh stalker at the beginning of stalker you know that kind of just degraded industrial landscape and I was not in a good mood in the dream. And there were these people kind of lurking figures and I was really lonely and I really wanted to make connection with, with people, somebody, anybody. But I, I, every time I tried to connect with any of these shadowy figures, they'd re react with hostility and, and potential violence. And, and then I saw very clearly that my desire to make connection with them was bound up with the reason that they were never going to make a connection with me there was i was in like a trap where i couldn't and i and i wasn't going to be able to connect so i was like well screw this i'm going to get out of here hey where, where is this place anyway and then i remember i remember like looking up at the sky going well i'm just going to check this place this weird place out i'm not going to do this game anymore of trying to connect with people so i look up in the sky and i'm like actually i can see the pixels in the sky you know, and as soon as I saw the pixels in the sky, I started to really focus in on this kind of like poor rendering of the sky. And then that action hurtled me into this other hyper dimensional kind of DMT world of like bright colors and explosive imagery. And it was almost like the dream machine. It wasn't even there were too many images to even capture. It was just like archetypes and patterns and colors and geometries and it was this is it was sort of like the the, the machine behind the surface of the dream mm -hmm. so you know i could say that 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 was a dream of insight sure maybe but it was also just a dream that was about how a really deep pattern that i have about how to construct the world so i i can't you know it's it's partly based on being somebody who likes philip k dick stories or who has always been interested in that kind of crack in reality thing so mm -hmm. on one level the glitch in the matrix is a familiar motif for me what an attractive one somewhat disturbing uh maybe attract attractive partly because it's disturbing 
undermining. Um, but then there's a, I think one where, where things get a little bit more real deal where it's actually like, wait, was that an anomalous perception or not? Was, was that actually a flicker in this appearance field? Was that actually like something that I'm experiencing now as a crack in this particular phenomenological world? And I can't say I've had many of those with the exception of synchronicities, because in a way that's what a synchronicity can function as. It doesn't have to be this way, but it's like an event whose seeming meaning, seeming, seeming meaning can only imply that the narrative running this or ordinary reality thing is insufficient and that there's some other layer of connection. Maybe it's outside of time, maybe it's on an, another kind of level. And so when you have a radical synchronicity, and they got to be pretty strong to count as glitches, you can have little mellow ones that just sort of seem like the universe is going Good job, kid. Keep keep on going into the mystery. But if you get a really intense one, it's like a rent because the the conventional narrative re, uh, logic of your day is is impossible at that point. Um, so I've do had. You have, do you have an example? I don't. Some of the most intense ones are are hard to reconstruct because of the situation that I was in when they when they happened. Mm -hmm. um i can remember one that is um i mean that's a little trivial i could this one this one is has a kind of nice meaning to it it's not it's not like super intense but it did mm -hmm. it was shocking at the time which is i was at the rainbow gathering in 1991 in vermont and there were some guys there there was a crew there that were doing sufi dancing and this isn't like actual Sufis. This is like the hippie thing that they called Sufi, Sufi dancing that had some relationship to some Western currents of, of Sufism. You know, Hazrat Inyat Khan was in there, sort of, but it was really about this guy from California named Sufi Sam, who was an heir to the, to the Levi's fortune, I believe, uh, mm -hmm. and was a spiritual teacher in the kind of crazy old coot manner and he started these sort of sufi ga sufi dancing which was like holy song sacred songs from different traditions and you do these sort of simple line dances with other people and uh you know in the right state of mind it could be actually pretty pretty heart opening and pretty sweet so i'd done it a couple of times and i and i, I ran into this crew when i was leaving the festival so i had all my stuff and i was leaving and then i ran into them and i had seen them i danced with these same people five years before at another at another uh, gathering and it had been really powerful then like really powerful in fact since i'm just telling a story i can just keep telling the story that first time that i ran into them which was you know four years before i guess um there was one where you would kind of uh there were two circles and you you face somebody and then you'd sing this thing to them about all i ever want from you is to remember you or some kind of sentimental sacred sentiment i don't really remember exactly the words but there was one woman that every time and she wasn't like gorgeous or anything particularly but there, any every time we we would meet it was like you know the skies would open it was like this sacred sort of encounter of archetypes or whatever and it was like how can one person do that it was super weird anyway so i had this very strong sense of this group which was led by a part partly uh, indigenous guy real earnest, earthy character. Anyway, so I ran into them again, the second thing in Vermont. I was like, oh, these guys again, this is, I gotta go check this out. So we did that, we did a number, you know, a bunch of songs and there was one that really, really struck me. And it was from, you know, I don't know if it was from the Zoroastrian tradition or someone who had just taken a, a poem and set it to some other folk tune. I don't know what the song was, but it was an invocation of Ahura Mazda, the, the being of light. and. Zoroastrianism is like really the first religion of light. It's sort of the first dualistic religion where there's a difference between the light and the dark and the good and the bad. And it's like, you know, in some ways it's a horrible development in the history of, of, of human thought and, and religion, but a very powerful one as well. So I was really moved by this 
this invocation of Ahura Mazda. And then I'm, so then I bid, bid adieu to everybody and, uh, uh, what did he, oh, he made one point that has always stayed with me. He talked about the way that all these uh, names of God uh, have, have the word, have the, the vowel sound ah in them, you know, Allah, Yahweh, even, even Buddha, if you want to pr pronounce it that way. And he talked about that as like this way of like resonating the heart, the chest, which I thought was kind of a cool, like physiological, uh, Q. Anyway, so I've I'm, I'm got my stuff, get my bag. I go out. I'm like, you know, and you've been a, I've been a week away at this like up in the mountains, you know, not near civilization, except the weird, you know, civilization of hippies. And I get back and I and I put my foot on the cement. So it's my first step back onto the cement in the parking lot. And then this car backs up and kind of like almost hits me, not in a violent way, but like, you know, it's just a parking lot backs up whoa and i look down and it's a mazda yeah <laughs> I, I somehow knew this was going to go there <laughs> yeah yeah of course you know so in a way it's no big deal but when those things happen you know they 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 feel glitchy although they feel less like a glitch and more like a kind of um like a mix like somebody like someone who's mixing rally drops something in there's there's intentionality to them Whereas the glitch implies like a, 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 a pro, you know, just a crack or like a bad yeah. code or uh, a, a signal, a problem with the signaling system or noise on the, on the line. So it's more random. Yeah. Um, no, no, pur no purpose, no apparent purpose. purpose. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But then yeah. people so, will talk. Yeah, go ahead. So what, what, what about deja vu's? Uh, yeah, I like I like me a deja vu. Um, <laughs> it's it's sort of not it's not too hard for me to imagine that you just you know there there's some if to take the myth of the brain again that we um, you know there's a part of you know that you just cross signals for a little bit and so it just feel like you know suddenly the the sensory input is rerouted as if it's coming from some memory zone. So I, I enjoy them, but I don't tend to put a lot on them with the occasional times that have felt like they were like past lives or something like that. You know, it was mm -hmm. like too, too extended and too like when they last for like a minute and a half or something and you're like saying things that you, you know, that that gets really pretty trippy. But I don't I don't I don't I, don't, I have never built any like different worldview based on them as kind of evidence. Um, I guess that's what I've, I've, I'm, what I'm saying that's interesting about this, these shifts that are happening now is that in the past, I developed a, uh, a, a particular way of looking at the world wherein I was able to experience, enjoy, and even really take seriously a wide variety of peculiar experiences without, in a way, letting them undermine a basically physicalist way of approaching and seeing the world. And even though I was interested in spirituality and did meditation and took psychedelics and blah, 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 and would read these different accounts of reality, I'd be like, this is great. This is good stuff. It's good for me. It's part of my life. But on some basic level, I didn't really, really challenge stuff, with some exceptions, for sure. Um, with some exceptions for like energy stuff, you know, healing. You know, th there, there, there's some, uh, there's some exceptions. It wasn't like I was a total hardcore physicalist. But I, but I think I was more of one than I thought I was. And it's not that I'm not now. But I am just aware of how much I was attached to a certain assumption, set of assumptions about what's happening. And now I'm like, well, maybe, you know, there's like a deeper level of like, well, maybe. Um, and it's so it's it's unsettling, but also kind of inter interesting and uh, exciting in, in a lot of ways. Yeah. You know, like I'm. 
I was thinking about the nature of thoughts as you were saying this as like even if we if even if we don't ask ourselves the big question about reality and stuff like that right but we start looking just at the the, the mere experience of or like the experience of the existence of thoughts and like you know like it it starts there for me it starts there I don't even need to go that far as to ask about myself about reality. Uh, you know what I mean? Like it's like on a on a on a even like much more human as we experience us as physical beings. The yes. thought, the, the the idea of the thought itself is already encompasses already like the big the biggest question in a way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's actually more helpful. I mean, I don't, I don't tend to think about the what is reality stuff too much on my own. Like I'll, I'll wrestle with it as part of uh, some larger discourse. But, but I, but uh, in in contrast, and along with what you're saying, I'm certainly more aware now of how my perceptions and beliefs and like strong beliefs about how reality is or my experience is my life goes are really just thoughts mm -hmm. and they're just thoughts in the way that other thoughts that i know are more uh, insubstantial are just thoughts and doesn't mean there aren't reasons for certain thoughts and reasons to avoid other thoughts etc cetera, etc cetera. but starting to see the way that in a way, I, I've I I hem myself in in all on all sorts of levels because of my conviction in certain thoughts that have just been around forever: psychological, ontological, political, uh, interpersonal. All these assumptions and congealed. Some of them really handy. Some of them even wise, based on experience. But. Uh, to you know to live lightly with one's own thoughts is a is a is a a very rich goal uh mm -hmm. not not uh, necessarily the easiest life because it can be confusing or um insubstantial because you're not you don't know where you stand you know it's like but um i also feel that's like part of the work actually is how to keep making sense without uh right riding or leaning too heavily on your congealed thoughts most of which are just things you picked up along the way and sort of worked and or are re reinforced by society around you and some of them are clearly you know not happy making and not helpful you know i've recently had the the thought interesting enough a thought that you know some people are more addicted to thinking than others powerful thought <laughs> no really it really is uh -huh. you know i i've spent my a lot a lot of my life around uh, around intellectuals but more of my life around people who are really smart but don't believe in thinking that much like the intellectual the classic intellectual it's all about thought and you, know, you see these guys that go to an academic conference and you see some not, not that many actually there's a lot of people have different attitude towards thinking but some people it's just like they're just going to dig in and and then another thing and another twist and another thing and if you come from this way da, 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 and it's just whew, you know and when i was younger i thought that's what it meant to be an intellectual when my actual life was had much more non-thinking in it or at least a attempt to non-think uh and now i'm aware of like wow like no, I'm just not going to think about that or I'm not going to just think right now too much. I'm just here. And that little urge in the mind to like dig in and bring up that last thing that you'd been thinking about that you didn't finish like you would ever finish. You never finish. That's the game. Oh, you got to dig back in there or reach forward into the future. And, you know, doing a lot of meditation, you start to recognize those moves and you start, you know, 
I mean, it's one thing to talk about what happens in meditation when thoughts quiet down, but much more interesting is when you're just living your life and you're like, yeah, I don't need to really think that much. Right. I'm just going to the store. It's, I just, I don't need to add anything. And then you get around people. I get around people now who are still like super thinkers. And it's like, it's a, it seems kind of crazy to me some often, like it's actually a little crazy. <laughs> yep, 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 totally. Hey, so, so this, this wonderful word, um, emotion or emotions, right? are emotions thoughts? Mm, such a good question. I wish I had a more coherent, uh, not answer, but just, I wish on my own that I had a richer model for that problem because I can really see both sides of it. And in a way, I think the point is less about what your answer is than what you do with that answer. So for example, if you say emotions really are just really are thoughts, that is, they emerge out of a certain take on the world that has a kind of conceptual dimension and can even be tracked back to a concept. The world is a fearful place. I'm not uh, able to handle all the things that the world can send me. So I'm, I'm already there. And so some anomalous flicker on my out of the corner of my eye kicks in fear because there's already a concept of the world as a fearful place. So it can positively lead me to interrogate and not believe my emotions because they're so true, you know, oh, this is reality when you know, you know, five minutes later, you're not going to feel that way or whatever. Um, but at the same time, there is a kind of energetic magic to emotions that by thinking about them as thoughts, as just another thought among many, it gets underplayed. It doesn't mean you deny it, but, but sometimes it feels really important to be like, emotions are like, they're like the pre-linguistic animal in us or the you know the intuitive animal in us and that by think by by uh putting them under the skein of thought we are sort of anthropomorphizing them more than they deserve and that it becomes then a way for us to deny our continuity with the fear that you see in an animal's eyes or whatever, not to say that they're not thinking too. they are, there are, there's clearly some kind of thought going on there. But so at the same, I, on the one hand, I, I'm really attracted to that idea. I'm a Jamesian and that's basically what James thought. On the other hand, uh, it's, it seems important to not do that too much the way that some rationalist people I know do it and there were, where it's just super, conceptualized what do you think what if we reverse the question you know are our thoughts emotions yeah it's that's that's sort of like what i what i'm kind of thinking that the the, the con the, these concepts that we, as you say, a linguistic concept, right? Like, the, and you, you were talking about pre-linguistic. I don't even know if there's such a thing. Um, because what we call linguistic is like, yeah, like tongue, uh, like, you know, like we speak, right? <laughs> but like, you could be grunting or like just using your nostrils to make a sound or whatever, like that's pre-linguistic as well. Right. And or you could be called pre-linguistic, but it can be it can be language. Sure. And and that's that's where I'm kind of like a little bit uh, uh, careful um, not to not to say there's something before language that is. 
different than what we access now with language, with what, what we call language. And, and I don't, I, I, I just don't know. I can't imagine a life without consciousness or thinking or some sort of inner voice or some sort of uh, analytical part in my brain or wherever that that sort of like gets into this sort of feedback loop with itself and and maybe by doing that creates some sort of consciousness or even creates reality that way or whatever but i but i do i do believe that to come back to the original question that basically the idea of emotions and thoughts and and even even the if we go back to the to the fabrication again like even like the idea of the five senses and stuff like that it's really it's really if you think about it it's just so it's such a wonderful story that if you think about it as being made up it's quite amusing like it's it, but amusing in a very positive way right like it's like like we've done this, like we, whatever. Like so, there, right. there's like this, 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 this common story that we're telling ourselves, and 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 so, like, yeah, emotions, thoughts, like I, I don't know. Yeah. I think, I think it's, I think it's all this, the same, same difference. Yeah. It re it reminds me of something. Just the other other night, I saw a wonderful uh, performance by a, a, a friend of mine named Sam Rowell. And she uh, just using like really um, basic technology that she got it, you know, wherever, like the hardware store, nothing fancy. <clears throat> she built this kind of sound and light show that was very much keyed towards um, provoking and confusing our, our recognition and response to color fields uh and she she did a series of is right now in la is doing a series of performances and i just man i was lucky I, I happened to be there and caught one night um and what she was talking about was uh the the way that that newton sort of organized these colors and the his desire for there to be seven colors because as an alchemist and as an astrologer, he, the number seven is a big deal. So he's like, well, there's got to be seven colors. So he, in, in establishing the color wave, assigns this goofy color indigo, which mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the, if, if you map out the whole spectrum of color, it takes up this tiny little band. And, you know, sure, I guess it's a color if you want it to be, but like it really indicates again like the crack in the system or the anomaly in the system that color is not all what we the way we think about it is and then obviously you can go to cultures where they don't have certain colors they only have red black and white that if you look go historically it's quite clear from western literature that the color blue doesn't appear until much later than other colors so color is clearly a construct and even without invoking the kind of physicalist argument like, well, no, they're just vibrational waves. It's our brains that are assigning color. It's like, yeah, OK, yeah, that's good. But that's that's not the really interesting thing. The really interesting thing is that we really live in this world saturated with color. And, and you and I can make can agree on really refined distinctions of particular shades of you know, whatever, magenta or mauve or teal or whatever, we can go, yeah, it's teal right there or whatever. But everything is like those colors. That's what you're saying. It's like emotions are like those colors. Thoughts are like those colors. Like, it's all like those colors, which is that you can't, you we're in them. They have meaning, they have affect, they even relate to, you know, physiological or physical properties in the world, vibrational properties. And yet, they don't exist the way that we think. And that's a very Buddhist idea. They, they don't, it's not that things don't exist. They just don't exist the way we normally think they do. Mm -hmm. And and so color for me is, I mean, really been a very interesting one to play with. And partly because I just saw this great performance. 
but as a very concrete example of what you were also saying about thoughts and emotions and the sense of self and the inner dialogue. So colors, and you, you mentioned like uh, the word uh, DMT or the abbreviation DMT before, where you were saying it's this colorful world. How interesting, right? Very like if we think about that, right? So, so you're basically kind of like you can take a substance that puts your brain <laughs> into into a different mode. Let's just say, right? It triggers something, and and the only thing thing that the brain can think of is colors and shapes and patterns, right? I I, I mean I have no experience with psychedelics whatsoever. So I can't really speak about that, but maybe you can tell us a little bit about that and what you have uh, learned over the years, over the decades. Well, I mean, DMT is such a conundrum uh, uh, because partly, I mean, the, the visual display is so extraordinary and consistently so and of, of a great variety. I mean, you know, there's there's sort of a recognizable signature visually. Yet within that, there are forms and landscapes and, uh, you know, bodies, but particularly um, geometries, seemingly hyperbolic geometries, meaning geometries that no longer sort of work in our three dimensional world, but are still have seemingly have coherence. And some people argue that they they can identify certain features of hyperbolic geometry inside DMT phases depending on dose and things there's some real wacky mad science out there about this stuff and then these extraordinarily vivid colors i mean it's it's true and on a, a number of psychedelics have that effect um in fact my friend's uh performance the other night it, it reminded me of another often very colorful effect which is taking nitrous oxide when one is on uh, another, you know, LSD or MDMA or something, you often get these like extremely rich sunset, like evocative color fields that, that melt and mutate in very beautiful ways. So it's like the, the aesthetic color button is like turned all the way up to 11 for, for a moment. And you're like, what is that? What's going on there? But the particular weirdness of DMT that's impossible to describe other than in just an abstract way is just how familiar this bizarre alien realm feels. It's like, oh yeah, this again, or I know this. And it's almost true, like uh, you could almost say that that's true physically. It's a very simple molecule and once we don't break it down in our bellies, it like, it just comes on like mother's milk. It's like, I know this. And, you know, that's just a claim. It's just like mystical experience. If I say, oh, I saw God and I saw I was one with everything. You're like, yeah, I've heard that before, but it doesn't, doesn't really do very much for me outside of the context of that experience. Drugs have that same feature. Um, but if we're talking about this sort of like how reality gets constructed, it's a very interesting question. The, the complexity, richness, and meaningfulness or apparent meaningfulness, pattern, temporal features, it's, uh, it's, really, it's really quite remarkable how much can happen with a particular substance. So on the one hand, this seems to support a physicalist argument. You can create such a different world with a little bit of material uh, uh, inside of a human physiology. Um, but that only kind of gets you halfway there because it's mm -hmm. so uh, extraordinary that it becomes difficult to, to wrap up in just, well, this is something that just kicks the brain around and, and you know, hits all these buttons like, the meaningfulness button or and the 
pattern button and whatever it just <laughs> hits all these buttons and so then you get this experience that feels realer than real um yeah that's always an argument so you're always able to do that but so i i have a um simple question about understanding this um like is like when say scientific studies are being made with dmt right uh, has there been any research into like if there's a difference when you are actually say in a uh, what is it called like a sensory deprivation tank for example versus you are in a place where like say outside and you can open your eyes and you can see like is is like outside trigger kind of like relevant for the experience do you know if there's any research um i wouldn't be able to say necessarily whether there were sp studies that specifically tested you know are there different is there different phenomenology if you are inside a lab versus or or you have eye shades on or you're in mm -hmm. in a uh uh certain kind of in a chamber versus being out on a lawn mm -hmm. i don't know there's not a lot of i mean there's a lot of the tests have to do with kind of sort of medical applications. So that's a little bit more phenomenological than a lot of the studies go to. Um, one of the features though of, of, of DMT in particular is that it seems to be relatively non-setting dependent. See. You know, um, you, you know, the idea of set and setting is a really core idea within psychedelics. There's a lot of evidence that the phenomenology is partly dependent on expectation, on the physical and cultural signifiers of the space that it's done, sound, light, comfort of the body, level of anxiety, et cetera, et cetera. It's clear that those things play a, a, a significant role in the phenomenology pure you know pure smoking dmt probably less so there's something kind of like it sort of just comes in storms in knocks over all the furniture and does what it's going to do that doesn't mean that there aren't images that come up that clearly relate to cultural expectation you know the famous example here is terence mckenna who to, to describe these self-transforming machine elves mm -hmm. and so people would go in there and they'd read terrence before they smoked dmt and they're like where are the elves and they come like oh, i saw the elves mm -hmm. i mean i've seen the elves i know what he means do i what does that mean i don't know i can't say um you know it's a funny one too because if you go back i mean terrence talked about that in the he started to do his public raps you know in the late 70s but really in the 80s uh, where he kind of got to be started getting a following, but you can go back into, I think it's a 1966 description by Timothy Leary of a DMT rapture, and he describes these little cavorting clowns. Okay, I don't know, I don't know what to say. Um, so clearly, there's some sort of setting, you know, there's some sort of expectation that can get circulated through those things to a degree. But there's another sense in, in, in which th that only gets you so far and you're in a hyperdimensional intergalactic palace of, you know, archetypal forces and figures, many of which you can't recognize or tie to any sort of human uh, mythological system, that they're just too weird for that. They don't fit. You don't have a way of, of languaging them. Um, mm -hmm. So it's interesting on that score too, or I think it's a little harder to link it directly to the situation that the body is in, in, in uh, immediately, with the possible exception, or I think probably with the exception of sound, that sound is a driver and um, kind of guider through a lot of these uh, spaces in particular. Um, there's something vibrational, tonal, yeah, was, overtonal. Yeah, I was I was going to ask about that because, like, I'm always surprised. Uh, I mean, basically, I'm not not a very visual person. I have a hard time even remembering faces and stuff. Right. So, um, 
that people, when they talk about psychedelic experience, this that it's so very much based on visual uh, experience, and, and at least you know, on the descriptive side of things, right? Yeah. Um, what what experiences do you did you have with with um, say the auditory mm. experience? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah. You, 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 you just said and I, I like that a lot what you say that like the so that the fact that we experience like uh, say other voices or sounds as sort of guides for how we move in this world uh for that to stay intact when you are in that kind of state it's kind of cool and makes makes a whole lot of sense and that's why i was asking about the sensory deprivation yeah right so but but yeah what 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 can you tell us about or tell me about the uh auditory uh, you know i think that there's a there's a there's a way in which the um what's a good example well in in i in in some in many many probably all traditional ayahuasca situations whether they are indigenous or more modern mestizo um, uh, sects or groups that have emerged more recently in the you know 20th century uh, that song and not just song but vocalizing and music in general is really key and this is the whole uh, in, in, in the indigenous context in particular, they talk about it, the Icaros, they're also part of the Mestizo traditions. Um, I'm familiar with some uh, folks who have studied with the Shipibo, and they have a particularly intense way of deploying the voice in healing, that to think about them as songs is to miss probably more than half of what's going on because mm -hmm. more than song, which implies like a tune and lyrics is as actually a kind of vibrational performance that acts as a kind of tool, even a invasive tool. Yep. Yep. And one particular feature of Icaros uh, that I think is some sort of true generally, but very true specifically with specific traditions is they are uh, nasal, vibratory, uh, and they buzz. And there's something about buzzing that is really powerful, not just in drug states, but in, in altered states in general, there's some, there are references to the buzzing of bees and mi ancient mystical accounts or accounts of visionary journeys. And there's clearly some kind of um, connection between buzzing sounds, high pitched overtone, vibrational nasal sort of sounds and shifts in the energetic phenomenological spaces of these substances. And again, not just substances, but also um, altered states, trance work, you know, w w without drugs. And it's always important to make that con re remind everybody. So once you start talking about drugs, it tends to be like it just takes over and you're just talking about drugs. But they're on a continuum with a variety of practices. And there's something about those sounds that are uh, really quite um, quite radical, and you can feel their effect internally, and then also phenomenologically in terms of like opening or shifting the whole framework of the experience that you're in. Um, of course, that you know some of the more standard effects of music, the, the lyrics will hit you, or the beauty of a of a voice or the, you know, the resolution of a chord or, you know, those kinds of things are also very powerful, but there's something specifically revelatory um, about the uh, 
you know, that, that, that kind of performance emphasis um, on vibration that points to a deeper mystery, I think, about music and vibration and the universe and vibration and whatever. That gets pretty mystical. But mm -hmm. uh, there's something there um, that is more than just song or more than just music. Eric, that's, that's why we like a good first pedal. Right. Yeah. <laughs> get get the beautiful buzziness there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, to totally. And you, you see, like that's kind of like also what I was talking about before, that what the the pre-linguistic, right? Yeah. It's um so and it's as as much tied to experiencing and emotions and thoughts as as words. You know, I find, yeah. And and can you? Uh, I mean, just because I'm so curious, I'll just one more question about this. So, say like any, you you pick the the psychedelic drug, okay? But like, so if you could describe like um, sort of like a an altered state altered state of of hearing, uh, is there anything that like you can report at that you or that you know uh, of? Um, I'm asking this because, as you say, like we have a sort of uh, an experience of what can be done with within our sound houses, our studios. Yeah, like, you know, reverbs, delay, uh, okay. like things things you can experience in nature. Um, you know, like there are like artificial effects, like horsing, which maybe you can get with two people singing. Then really flanging. Can you get flanging with? Or, oh, okay. I in nature, I don't know. So, so what what kind of experience uh, of that kind is there in such an altered state, if at all? Yeah, I mean, I I, I mean, unfortunately, I'm not um, technically sophisticated enough to really be able to confidently identify a variety of sound effects that you can produce uh, with gear and then bring that into experience and be able to say oh like that was sort of a chorus effect or that was that because i just don't quite have that facility mm -hmm. um and in turn i'm trying to think of like i i i i can think of a lot of examples of when sound has done certain things but you're asking more for the special effects of sound or music itself and they're there for sure um, but I don't know if I could describe anything other than an intensification of familiar effects um, okay. in the way that, I mean, another way of saying it is that it feels like on some level, part of what psychedelics are is they're just signal processing. That's what you're doing. You know, that's what your brain is doing. And mm -hmm. uh, I, again, visual metaphors might be easier for, for me and, and a lot of people. So, you know, the, uh, you know, tracers, you know, you, you know, you move your hand and you see the stuttered, you know, uh, traces of your hand. And, okay, well, that's clearly just some kind of temporal signal thing. And you can build on that and it becomes magical or it becomes meaningful. But on some basic level, it's just signal. You're just, yeah, you're changing yeah. the gain of the, of the, tr of the length of, of the retinal, effect or whatever whatever is happening upstream and there's all sorts of audio analogs of that that happen that aren't happening in the world that are maybe happening internally hearing sounds within that become very uh, distinct that have these kinds of effects having sounds like thrown around you know the room um that's that has definitely come up but in terms of being able to describe them with, with great acuity um, I'm not sure I can do that. Definitely like uh, overtones that take over <laughs> and then you're like, go away. Um, uh, there's also a particular substance and, and the, the drug nerds may chastise me for misnaming it, but I believe it is 5-MeO-D-I-P-T, forgive me drug nerds if I am wrong, but there is a particular substance that is well known to cause a fascinating, though largely unpleasant, audio phenomena, which is that nothing sounds good. You put on a you put on a favorite track, and it's 
off. It's wrong. It doesn't cohere. It's it, it's jarring. It's edgy. I have not experienced this, so I am merely or uh, uh, but it's but it is fairly pretty widely attested to. Um, and that, that that would be awesome to have as a plug-in on your DAW. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> you know, abs absolutely. <laughs> now it's a that's, a, no, that's an idea here. Yeah, it's a good question though about about other effects. Those that's the one that I think of as the most sort of an unusual in a way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, because because like this whole idea of uh, visual distortion. That's that's sort of like like if it's just like the colors are more vibrant or or. Uh, like something's bent out of shape or like all of these things are very easy to imagine even without taking drug right but with with the audit the effect on the auditory system it's it's harder for me to kind of like understand what it may do if you like what you just said about that special drug let's say uh kind of like makes sense makes more sense to me than just thinking of like suddenly hearing a voice with, with reverb or something right. because like if you if you just if like the effect of the drug is that the you know whatever you're hearing is being misinterpreted or scaled differently or whatever and you kind of like hear like your beautiful Bach chorale uh <laughs> you know like stretched by I don't know 15 cents in yeah. every direction in like, every direction or, right you know for example you know that you know like okay i see so like yeah yeah i i will i have to read up on that a little bit but it's <laughs> so what 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 are you up to at the moment in terms of in terms of uh, writing or like your work um i just finished a project uh so i'm actually a little bit at a in a breather point um i was doing my substack publication the burning shore a lot through it was like one of my pandemic projects both the book and my substack were like pandemic projects i started them at the beginning um one, one coincidentally and one quite intentionally in order to kind of take advantage of the of more time to write and i stopped i stopped doing my my substack for about four, four or five months and i'm going to start again but much mellower than i had been um, I had been writing long articles and they kept getting longer and more detailed and I'm a crafter so I keep reworking my prose I don't it doesn't come out that way I have to work at it but I it's really hard for me to let it go into the world without polishing it and that takes a lot of time so I was just realizing how much energy I was pouring into it so I'm trying to be more thoughtful about my my focus and I have a couple of short pieces that I'm going to be working on probably in the next month or so, but I have some other things that long-term, um, but I'm, I'm, they're at an early enough phase that there's not much to say about them. Uh, so I, I, but I, I, would, I would say I'm kind of re, you know, maybe like even reformulating my relationship to writing, being a little clear about why I'm doing it. Um, and I think, you know, if I look at my, you know 30 years of writing there's like been these peaks of like really intense books and then more like journalism and essays and then a book and da 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 and i did this intense book which was my dissertation book and then i did another book which ended up being more the actual writing wasn't that hard and didn't wasn't that long but the research and the you know yeah the research and the thinking about it proved quite taxing so I think I, I I need a little bit of like space right now um, to do to do different things and I, you know the 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 place of writing in our world is changing um, it's always been changing but uh, it's it's sometimes a little hard for me to to uh, figure out what it is I know what it means for me and that might be part of the shift is that I start doing things that are even more directly just what I want to do I've always done that. I've never written anything. I've never even gotten paid for any for writing anything that I wasn't basically interested in writing, even if it was just an experiment to see what it would be like to 
write a little bit of ad copy or write a screenplay that wasn't very good, but like, you know, kind of interested in trying different genres. Um, but, uh, but I probably still will write a couple more nonfiction books kind of in a, in an Eric Davis mode, uh, at least for now. Um, have you written fiction? I don't even know. Not really. No. Um, I've tried a few things. I, I think there's certain kinds of things that might work. It just, it would just take a lot of work to learn how to do some basic things that are requisite to most kinds of fiction writing. I, I'm sure there's probably a mode of, of writing that I could do that would be fun and more or less fictional, but it's not going to, wouldn't take the form of like, here are the characters having a dialogue and then there's an event and they have to face the event and overcome it. And, you know, that kind of thing is like, I would need to learn a lot to be able to do that adequately, I believe. Um, so there's what, what, would that creative. be something you would want to do to write like that? I mean, is that not really, not really, it's not that attractive. I can imagine doing something like a fake memoir or, or, um, you know, a, more of a first person fan, you know, fantasy or something that's maybe more experimental or, or brings in ideas and, and, you know, narrative stuff like, you know, Seabold or, or something like that, where they're, they're more like kind of fictional essays or something like that. So yeah. I, I, I'm, I am interested in that, but I still have a lot of like ideas that want to be kind of come through me that. I feel more obliged to be more clear and to, you know, there's a, there's a particular force that when one is writing nonfiction that you have some relationship with truth uh, and without getting into the philosophy <laughs> of it or what exactly that means, it, it, it has a um, clarifying character that's very uh, sort of psychologically interesting it's like if you write a sentence that's off even if the sentence makes sense it might even be the cool thing to say but you don't really believe it you can't really put it in there so there's a kind of like weird truth telling to yourself as you're constructing these things and of course i've written things now that i don't agree with and and i'm sure i've written some things that i didn't even necessarily agree with at the time but I, they seem like a good thing to try so it's not like it's a hundred percent but um, not having that there and having some other core, kind of core guide uh, in a fictional situation for me is quite a drastic shift. And then it's like, what does the writing want? And I'm like, I don't know, <laughs> you know, so, uh, uh, but it, in a way it would be, it, it will be a shame if I don't sort of see what that's, what that's about for me. Um, but I would need to give myself a different kind of construct than I have right now. Uh, as I said, there's a couple of projects that are, are wanting to come through um, that don't, aren't that experimental. Yeah, I, I don't uh, remember if I ever told you, but and maybe this says a lot about my inbox, right? But like receiving your, <laughs> your, your uh, Substack uh, newsletter, right? Uh, is always uh like the highlight for me like i you know i'm not a, i don't read much i'm not uh educated in the art of writing at all or even in the in the art of reading um but your stuff is really is really quite something and i i mean i have to admit that it's really hard for me to read like a, a whole article but for me just the first paragraph like it's it's wonderful i mean it's and it's like the first time that you told me that you like that you uh work hard on it you know like that you kind of you know re rewrite and rethink things and stuff but it's it's very clear that it's a very very there's a very uh deep craft at work craft work <laughs> uh as well as sort of like an artistic um artistic being and that's why I was asking about the fiction. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I'm, I'm curious too. I mean, I, I recognize that at least half of what I do is art, not, it's not intellectual, it's, a, it's art. It's like craft and color and resonance and, 
image and you know all of that is is half of at least half of what i'm doing even if i'm also writing something intellectual or critical or historical so what that would be like without you know kind of more taking the lead i really don't know um mm -hmm. and i think i it, but it would take some work to get there because i'm so used to driving the writing with an idea of me reacting to the world and truly articulating how much I can not truly like there's that's it gets naive like oh do I, is this true I don't know but like uh, authentically articulating how I am responding to the world to a book to a movie to a text to a religious group to an experience that that quest to be authentic in your articulation is so deep in there that to be like hey I could just make it up like I could be a different kind of person. It's like liberating, but also kind of, you know, dizzying in its uh, range of possibilities. It's like, I always imagine you, you musicians sitting there with like, you know, like this, you know, this computer and then this immense mixing board and a 20, 20, 1500 pedals. And you're like, okay, <laughs> this is the first sound I'm going to make. Bonk, <laughs> you know, and then like it's just, it's insane like the range of, of so for me that that authenticity to experience or to my own thinking is like a guide that coheres the immense possibility of words and writing um that said i am i have no doubt that there are obsessive topics that could keep me keep me going through a through a fictional or a parafictional project but you know, in, in that context, the, the word and the concept that you used before, like the truth, right, is sort of like, it's super, is super interesting. I, I have to say that is, I find that very inspiring. Uh, anyway, that's, that's sort of like uh, <laughs> something for, that is, that's something that inspires me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I know that great, I know enough about how some artists work that they would say almost they would say the same thing just in a different context mm -hmm. that there is also this kind you can you can see that in in great work you know like it's certain kinds of poetry certain kinds of music certain kinds of uh you know fiction writing where they're being true to something about how they see the world in this other language um so I, it's not a black and white uh, thing by by any means uh, so yeah, it's, I'm, I'm very interested. I, 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 I hope I have time and the effort to see what might, you know, given enough time to see what might happen in that domain. So, so do you remember, um, like the first time that this concept or like, maybe you didn't use this, the same word, but the concept of truth ever came up? in your life yeah it, it is a word i don't tend to use um and i'm not even sure why i used it today except that i guess i've been thinking about it a little bit i was listening to a philosophy tape about actually about this question about illusion mm -hmm. and he was, he was kind of re-triangulating these like appearance truth illusion deception so it was mm -hmm. partly in my head, but it's, that's a good one. That's a really, I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not coming up with anything that, that clear because I don't think it was really, I don't think it was really, I don't think I thought about it in those terms when I was starting to write what I would think of as criticism, which was really the first thing that I would write about where I was writing about my feelings and thoughts about some book or music or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think I thought about it in terms of truth. I thought about it in terms of like articulating a point of view. Uh, and then it became more, it became clear to me that having unusual experiences or unusual points of view then made an interesting artistic challenge because you had to articulate that in a way that was clear to people. Um, and particularly when you were articulating things that couldn't be articulated in clear, transparent language. Like that's more like a poet. So like a poet is, there's a lot of truth in the sense that I'm using it now in poetry, but it's not 
didactic. It's not propositional. It's not like science. So what is it? How could it be true then if it's images and rhetoric and allusion and all these sort of messier humanistic effects in, in, a, in a linguistic sense? But there is something there is something there. So I'm not sure when, when that sense of fidelity kind of came came to be. Um, actually, this is this is raising one. It's not quite the answer to your question, but it's an interesting story that was definitely a turning point in my intellectual life. It was senior year in high school. So I'm like uh, six, six, 15, 16. And uh, taking physics, very boring teacher, very boring teacher. Like he had been in the Navy, he was like a jarhead, a jarhead haircut. He droned on and on like this, this older man, super tedious. And I sat in the back and would just like, you know, flirt and doodle and, you know, not really pay a lot of attention. But we were studying Kepler's laws of planetary motion. And somehow in the textbook, they had mentioned, which is unusual. I assume it was in the textbook. Maybe I read it somewhere else, but I doubt it. I think it was in the textbook. They had mentioned that Kepler was also fascinated by, um, you know, uh, Platonic solids. And he mapped the planet, the relationships between the planetary uh, orbits in, into the, onto this like bizarre object where you would take a platonic solid and put it inside another platonic solid, put it inside it. And there's only so many platonic solids and they, and all the ratios matched. Yeah. And for him, that was his great insight. That was much more important than, than ellipses. Yes. And when we were talking about this and I remember going, Hey, this is incredibly important. And the guy was like, no, it's not important at all. That was, those were just fallacious ideas. What was important was the law. And I'm like, and that gap between him and I could see his truth. I understood why he saw truth or the history of truth that way. And then what I saw was not that. And what I saw was my path. Like that was very clear. That was sort of an interesting, uh, encounter with kind of different modalities of truth in, as they relate to, you know, the most kind of physical claims, you know, the most concrete claims you could make about the structure of the physical world. Yeah. yeah. Thoughts and emotions. Right. And it was, like it on, was on his, on his, on his, yeah. on his side, it was the thought. Yeah. On his side, it was the emotion. Totally. Totally. Yeah. And, and that's why you're an artist. I guess. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, Eric, thank you so much. This was just wonderful. And I was I was waiting for you to be available for this for like a couple of years even. So uh, thanks for making this happen. Like Absolutely. I've, I've, I've slowed down considerably with this uh, podcasting idea. And I know that you used to have a podcast, right? Yeah. Uh, I, and then I took a break. <laughs> yeah, Oops. Yeah. Wait, where did that go? You know? <laughs> anyway, thank you so much. And uh, I'll hope to see you again very, very soon. Wonderful, Marcus. It was a great conversation. You're welcome. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.